Proverbs chapter 24, verse 1. The Lord says, Do not envy wicked men. Do not envy wicked men. And I suppose that's a pretty easy trap to fall into sometimes and with some people because wicked people do have success a lot of times in this world. And what I mean by success is that they may have wealth and they may have position. And it's understandable how the wicked, those without biblical scruples, may have wealth and position in this world. It's only because they don't mind sinning to get it. Now you, if you're a Christian, and you are dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ, walking in the Spirit, you will not do you know, whatever it takes to be successful in the eyes of this world, but they will. But God says, never envy those who are wicked. Don't envy those who are enjoying the temporary success, the temporary pleasures of sin. Don't envy them. Always remember that the pleasures of sin, the success that comes from sinning, is only for a season. It's not going to last forever, and then there will be a huge price to pay in the end. Let's look at the next verse. Verse 2. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. It says, Do not envy wicked men. Do not desire their company. For their hearts plot violence, and their lips talk about making trouble. Yeah, God says, do not, do not envy the wicked person, and do not desire the company of the wicked people as well. Don't hang around with people who don't care about God. Stay away from them as much as you possibly can, because hanging around with them, desiring their company is the first step in learning their ways. And we all have enough bad in ourselves because of our sin nature. We're all bad enough because of our own sin nature. We sure don't need to be hanging around with others who will drag us down even lower. And so God says, stay away from them. Verse 3. By wisdom, a house is built, and through understanding, it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. You know, God is saying if you do things the right way, you're going to be blessed. And there is a right way to do things, and there's a wrong way to do things. Even when it comes to building your house. It's not just spiritual things, but building your house. And gaining material things. I mean, if you build your house properly using acceptable building codes, if you build your house properly with wise and skilled carpenters and plumbers and electricians and builders of all kinds, if you do it the right way, well, then your house is going to be there for you and it's going to be a blessing to you because you took the time to do it the right way and you used wisdom and knowledge to put it all together. And what is true when it comes to your house or any kind of physical things in your life, what is true in that area is also true in your spiritual life. And the point that God is making is this. If you conduct your life in a godly manner, if you put Him first, if you do things the correct way, you're going to be much better off in the long run. Verse 5. A wise man has great power. And a man of knowledge increases strength. God is saying that a wise and knowledgeable person has great power. Now, he may be or she may be physically weak, but their wisdom and their knowledge, their spiritual sense, gives them the equivalent of great power. A wise and knowledgeable person has the equivalent of great strength even though they may be lacking somewhat in physical strength. Their wisdom, their knowledge, their spiritual sense makes up for it. Boy, this is true when it comes to baseball pitchers. Many of you remember 
Nolan Ryan, great baseball pitcher for the Houston Astros and other teams back in probably the late 70s, mid-late 70s and the 80s. Nolan Ryan. Has anybody ever pitched or thrown as fast as this guy? I remember one game he was clocked at 107 miles an hour. His fastball came in 107. I don't think anybody has ever beaten that. He was a fireballing pitcher. Man, he just blow people away with his fastball. But then, you know, as he got older, and he got over 40 years old, he didn't have that 170, 107 mile an hour fastball anymore, but he had developed into more of a pitcher than a thrower. You know, he had gained the wisdom of the years, from the years that he had pitched. And, and so he became more of a pitcher and less of a thrower. He didn't have the physical strength, but he still threw a couple, maybe even three no-hitters, I think, even after he slowed down some. And it's like God says, a man of wisdom, a man of knowledge has great power. And so a man of wisdom actually has more power than a man of muscle because his wisdom, his knowledge, his skill makes up for the lack of muscle. And it's true, again, in our spiritual life. A man of God's word is mightier than a man of physical strength. You're going to get a lot more accomplished. You're going to be more successful being a man of God's word than you are going to be just if you're just a, a man of physical strength. It's like, you remember the show, Gilligan's Island, the skipper, no doubt he was the strongest man on that island. However, the professor was the one, wasn't he, that solved all the problems. And there's an example of it. Look at verse 6. For waging war, you need guidance. And for victory, many advisors. So, in verse 5, God lays down the principle. A wise man has great power. And then in verse 6, he gives us an example of wisdom prevailing over might. <clears throat> When he says, for waging war, you need guidance. And for victory, many advisors. He's talking about more than military strength. He's talking about the need for wisdom. That's more important in a war. Both are important, but you've got to have good planners. You've got to have good generals, smart people at the top, calling the shots, making the plan. You know, England was a lot tougher than we were during the Revolutionary War, but we beat them because we, have a better, we had a better plan than they did. And those of you old enough to remember Vietnam know that we could have wiped out North Vietnam in a matter of hours. We could have wiped them out. We could have won that war so easily. We had much more power than North Vietnam, and yet we lost that war. Why? Due to some politically mo motivated, lousy war plan. What a, just a terrible, terrible waste. Terrible tragedy. And the principle is this. You can waste a lot of energy and waste a lot of time and come up empty if you don't live by the principles and commands of Scripture which are wise and knowledgeable. Verse 7. Wisdom is too high for a fool. In the assembly of, at the gate, he has nothing to say. Wisdom is too high for a fool. And the only reason that wisdom would be too high for anyone is if they don't care enough to do what is needed to pursue it. Then it's too high for them because they don't care enough to go after it, to do the things that need to be done to go after it. And in that case, you're looking at a fool. I mean, if somebody is given over to the pleasures of this life, if somebody loves bad company, if somebody refuses to seek God through the Word of God, and through prayer, well, they're not going to have wisdom. Not if they do those foolish things. They're not going to have wisdom. And it's because they are a fool. Which is why God says wisdom is too high for a fool. Look at 7 again. Wisdom is too high for a fool. In the assembly of the gate, he has nothing to say. Well, he didn't put anything worthwhile in his brain. He didn't spend time with God. So, you know, when somebody needs some advice or some counsel, he has nothing to say. Why? Because he wasted his time putting garbage in his brain. Now he doesn't have anything worthwhile to say to anybody. The gate was the official business place. It was the place where official business was conducted in the city. And so what God is saying is that if a person doesn't put anything worthwhile in their mind, if a person doesn't put 
God's word in their mind and so they're chasing around after all sorts of worthless things well then they're not going to have anything worthwhile to say either now if you're a decent human being you want to contribute to the welfare of your family you want to contribute to the welfare of your nation to whatever the people around you and it's not going to happen unless you put God first you walk with God you put God's word inside of you and your words will be good for others as well as for yourself verse 8 He who plots evil will be known as a schemer. And that really was a a title of reproach. And it still is. To be known as a schemer, that is not a good thing. Nobody would want to be known as a schemer, I hope. Although some people probably do. But, you know, anyone who plots evil will be known as a schemer. It is bad to do evil. Everybody does evil. Everybody does bad things. But it is much, much worse to be one who also plots those bad things. They are a schemer. That is much worse than somebody who just falls into bad things or occasionally does bad things. To plot bad things? No, that's that's worse. That's being too much like the devil. Because that's what he does. He doesn't just do bad things. He schemes. He plots evil things things. He makes plans you know, to bring about evil. That's too much like the devil. And the desire to plot evil is spiritual poison that is just flowing through the veins of Satan and his demons. And it is a spiritual poison that flows through the veins of people who not only do evil but also plot to do evil. They are spiritual poison. Verse 9. Look at this verse. The schemes of folly are sin, and men detest a mocker. The schemes of folly are sin. We're going to see this in a couple of weeks. People who commit a sin and then say, oh, I was only joking. You know what? Sin is sin. Evil is evil. You say, but it was just a joke. I know, I know the language that I used was off-color, and I know the thing that I did could be considered sinful, but it was just a joke. Well, that's not exactly true. Sinful talk is sin. Sinful action is sin. The sinfulness of sin is not removed simply because it is semi, someone's idea of humor. It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> Ten. If you falter in times of trouble... How small is your strength? Yeah, talking about faith, really. If you falter in times of trouble, your faith is pretty small. What good is a faith if it doesn't sustain you through times of trouble? People don't need faith when everything is going their way, when they're feeling good and they don't have any aches and no pains and they've got plenty of money and and all that kind of stuff and everybody is happy and healthy. They don't need faith. They live by sight at that point, but... Boy, when things go wrong, that's when your faith really needs to kick in and sustain you. And a faith that doesn't is worthless. It's like Confederate money. Confederate money is useless because it isn't going to you know, allow you to buy anything. And a faith doesn't, that doesn't keep you going through tough times is just as useless as Confederate money today. You say, well, what do I do? I feel like my faith is faltering. I'm going through hard times and it seems like my faith isn't really sustaining me the way I would like it to. What do I do? Listen to the words of God Almighty in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. God says, Consider Him, that is Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So, when you are growing weary because problems are starting to overwhelm you and you are starting to lose heart God says consider Jesus think about Jesus and so if you are saved but you're starting to falter because of hard times like God says consider Jesus think about Jesus think about how Jesus kept going and suffered so much because it was the Father's plan 
to save you from hell. Think about how he did that. Think about how Jesus persevered. Because thinking about how Jesus kept going for you will encourage your faith and cause you to keep going for him. Verse 11. Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. Rescue those who are being led away to death. And it presumes that they are innocent people that are being led away to death. And there's a good example of that in modern life. And a good way to apply this verse. Within the law. I'm not talking about breaking the law. Because you should never do that as a Christian. But within the law, do what you can to end abortion. It means vote for the right person. You know, elect the right judges. Work within the law, however God would lead you, to end abortion. Because they are some of the innocent that are being led away to death. In fact, I was listening to WTMJ out of Milwaukee yesterday. And they were talking, they had, they had put a picture up on their website about this, uh, concerning this, this fetus. And I believe the fetus was 20 weeks, 20 weeks old. So just, what, just barely over halfway there. Um, 20 weeks old. And there was some kind of a physical problem. And, and they were going to operate, or they did operate on this fetus. And what they did was they opened the mother up, they removed the uterus, and they put a little slit in, in there. And the doctor operated on the baby while it was inside of the mother. And during the operation, either before or after, whatever, this little baby, now God just put his little hand through that slit and grabbed onto the finger of the doctor. Now, you tell me that that child is not a human being, is not a baby, until it is born, you are out of your mind. You are living in the dream world if you think that is true. And so they are one group that are definitely being led to slaughter and uh, innocent as anybody could be. But the point here in verse 11 is this. The kind of religion that God wants from you and I is a religion that starts by receiving Christ by trusting in Him for eternal life and His finished work on the cross. It starts by receiving Christ, but then it works itself out in helping those who need help. It works itself out in helping those who need help and being strong for those who are not strong and protecting those who cannot protect themselves. And I just want to turn over to Isaiah 58, verse 6 and 7, because... Listen to what God says about this. It just backs up exactly what I just said and what He has just said. Isaiah 58, 6 and 7. You know, the Israelites, they were fasting, literally fasting from food, but their heart wasn't right with God. They were just doing it as an outward thing, as a religious show, thinking that they would impress God, but they had not repented of their sins and they were not living the way God wanted them to live. And so God says, Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and, to, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? And so God is saying, you know, this is what I want you to do. Work out your faith by protecting those who cannot protect themselves and by helping those who need help and being strong on behalf of the weak. And so he says, rescue those, back in Proverbs 24, verse 11, rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering toward slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he has done? In other words, no one can pull a fast one on God. You know, nobody can say, well, hey, I didn't know. And get away with it if they did know. God knows if we knew that there was a, a need that we could minister to and we either did minister to it or chose not to minister to it. God knows. 
God knows the opportunities that we have had to do what is right, and he knows if we took advantage of them or not. And remember, remember this. You cannot earn your salvation by doing good deeds. I listened to somebody on the radio yesterday who was saying that, that you earn your salvation by doing good deeds and by treating others well. That is not true. The Bible teaches over and over again you are saved by faith. But good works and good deeds are a byproduct of salvation by faith. And so, God knows about your opportunities. And you can't be saved by doing good deeds, but your opportunities and what you did with them will be judged by Christ after you get to heaven. And what we do with our opportunities will determine our eternal rewards, which will determine how much we will enjoy eternity if we are Christians. Verse 13. I like this verse. Eat honey, my son, for it is good. Honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. You know, I've never tasted honey in my entire life. I never did. But God says, eat honey. I guess it's good. People like it. But I like God. I not only serve God, I not only want to be totally dedicated to God and, and get out His Word and worship Him and all that stuff, but I genuinely like God. He is such an easy God to like. He's a likable person. He's a likable God. He wants us to enjoy life. I mean, that's clear from this verse. The Bible says that God has created good things for us to enjoy. And so the devil comes along and he says to you, he says, you know, God doesn't want, to have, want you to have fun. He wants to rob you of a good time. What a liar he is. If God didn't want you to enjoy life, he would not have given you eyes to see or ears to hear, a nose that can smell or taste or touch or the ability to walk or talk or, or, or all those things. Some, not everybody has all those abilities. But God has been so good to us. If God didn't want us to enjoy life, He wouldn't have made the beautiful creation that we have. If God didn't want us to enjoy life, He would have made everything black and white and He would have made all the delicious food that He has created he would have made it all taste like tree bark. That would have been a good way to make us miserable. Don't believe that lie. God doesn't want you to have fun. He's trying to cheat you out of a good time. He says, eat honey. It tastes good. And by the way, by the way, there doesn't always have to be nutritional value for everything that we eat. I know that because of what God says right here. He says, eat honey. Why? Because it tastes good. Do it because it's fun. Do it for kicks. God's not opposed to that. He's opposed to, to, you know, if we live for honey, but he's not opposed for us to, uh, toward us. I'm sorry, let me start over again. He's not opposed to us going out and having a nice time and doing something just for the fun of it, like eating honey or whatever. But look at the flip side of verse 13. In verse 14, he says, God also says this, so, Know also that wisdom is sweet to your soul. If you find it, there is a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. In other words, enjoy the good things that God creates. Let your body enjoy the good things that God has created. But don't overlook the most important thing. And you see, the problem with some people, probably the problem with most people, is they are unbalanced in their life. They enjoy material things, they enjoy the physical things of this world, and so their bodies are very happy because every single one of their bodily appetites are being satisfied, and so their bodies are happy, but their souls are miserable because they don't give their souls the pure word of God that they crave. Your soul craves the pure word of God. And if you're watching it today, this program today, you're giving your soul what it craves, the pure word of God. But some people don't do that. They feed the body, but they don't feed the soul. And God wants balance in our lives. And so these two verses, and God is saying, let your body enjoy itself, but let your soul enjoy itself as well. 15. Do not lie in wait like an outlaw against a righteous man's house. Do not raid his dwelling place. For though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. 
but the wicked are brought down by calamity. And so God says a righteous person may fall into calamity many times. God says that. And that kind of shoots a big hole in the doctrine that if you are a righteous person living by faith, you won't have calamity because you can, you know, bind that calamity from touching you. You know, that really, that really brings in the offerings because people want to hear that. And the charlatans who preach that garbage, they ought to read the whole Bible instead of pulling a few scriptures out of context, way out of context, and building that doctrine. God says a righteous person may fall into many calamities. And yeah, God says he'll recover from each one. He'll recover each time. God provides the grace to overcome and the grace to endure for those who walk with him. And endurance produces patience and patience produces hope and hope produces character, says the book of James. And so it's not that trouble doesn't come to those with faith. It's just that God causes them to rise above the trouble and even become better people because of it. 17. More polished Christians, actually. Do not gloat when your enemy falls. When he stumbles, do not let your heart rejoice. For the Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath away from him. Now, let's say somebody hurts you. Somebody sins against you and they don't apologize and they intend to do it again or whatever. Say somebody hurts you. And because God is your shield and He is your protector and He is your avenger, He gets them. And He he lets them have it because they hurt you, His child. It would be a big mistake for you to taunt them in the midst of their trouble. Even though they're being punished by God for the evil that they have done to you it would be a big mistake for you to taunt them in their trouble because God considers that taunting gloating vindictive spirit to be just as punishable as the sin that they committed against you in the first place and so don't fall into that trap don't rejoice in the death of the wicked don't rejoice in the suffering of the wicked. Look what God says in 17. I'm going through 21, by the way. Do not gloat when your enemy falls. When he stumbles, do not let your heart rejoice. And when I read this, I can't help but think of some athletes, especially football players. I don't see it as much in baseball, and I don't see it in hockey, and I don't see it in basketball, really, either. It may be there, but I see it especially in the NFL, the taunting and the cockiness, you know? This, and it's not cute, and it's not cool. It is sin. I, I think of somehow, some athletes, some of them especially, how, how they conduct themselves. You know, competition is good. Competition is, is a good thing. But cockiness and taunting is not good. It is sin. It is just as important to God that you be a gracious winner as you being a gracious loser. Look at 17 through 20. Do not gloat when your enemy falls. When he stumbles, do not let your heart rejoice. For the Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath away from him. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of the wicked. For the evil man has no future hope and the lamp of the wicked will be snuffed out. Someone says, oh, I wish I, I wish I was like that bad person over there who's not living for God because he seems to have it made. Don't, don't wish that. That is like saying, I wish I, was, I wish I was Saddam Hussein a couple of years ago. It's like somebody saying a couple of years ago, I wish I was Saddam Hussein because he has all this power and he has a palace and he has all sorts of material wealth You mean he had all that stuff. He doesn't have anything now. And that will be the end of all the wicked. They will all end that way. It's it's true that evil people sometimes have it made for a while right now. But don't envy them. Like we saw in the very first verse that we looked at today. Don't envy them. Don't envy anyone who lives for the things of this world and excludes God. Because it's just not going to last. And the end is going to be trouble for them. 
And so when you're tempted to envy people like that, remember their end, and you will snap out of it in a hurry. The Bible says, God says they have no future hope. It's all right now. They are cashing in the future for the evil that they are doing now. They are not worthy of envy. 21. Fear the Lord and the King, my son, and do not join with the rebellious. God hates rebellion of any kind. He hates rebellion. It is the sin of Satan. It is the first sin ever committed. Rebellion and pride. And so don't be a rebel, says God. Don't rebel against the laws of God. Don't rebel against the laws of the state. Don't rebel against the laws of the country. Don't rebel against the rules at work. Don't rebel against the rules.